O come, O come, Emmanuel, and fill this place. Fill this place with your love, fill this place with your joy, fill your place with your, your peace, so that we may prepare our hearts for not just the celebration of Christmas, but for the work and for the ministry you do in our lives and for the return of Christ to make all things new. So Lord, we pray that you let the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart here be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Well, last year we kicked off, last year, last week we kicked off the beginning of the season of Advent. And, you know, I, I love the season of Advent, just the, you know, the, the lights, the, the decorations and everything. You know, if you've noticed and drove by the sanctuary on, uh, over the past week at night, you notice we have the lights back up on, on the sanctuary to, uh, to celebrate Christmas. And I, I just love the feeling that that brings. And one of the things that I wanted to do this year, I wanted to give us a, a different feeling for Advent this year. If you have noticed, it's, it's, it's a little subtle change, but it is definitely a change that we have made this year. Over our Advent candles that we have on our Advent wreath this year, instead of being purple and one pink candle, we have blue candles. And last, I bought a new stole for this Advent season. I bought a blue stole because I wanted to change how we looked at this Advent season. Normally, we have had the color purple for our Advent candles and for the stoles that I would wear during the season. But for me, whenever I look at that, even in the middle of Advent, my mind goes to the season of Lent. Because Lent is the season where, where, we, where we do purple everywhere and, and we have the stoles and, and everything. And, and when I think of the color purple and whatever I think what color that represents, it represents to me repentance. It, it, it look, it, it, something that it comes to mind is, is sacrifice. Those, those two things are something that whenever I see the color purple, I, I think about in my life. And, and while... The, series, the season of Advent is a series, season of repentance and it's a season of sacrifice. I think it misses the full picture of what exactly the season of Advent is all about. And, and the color blue, instead of giving a, a picture of, of sacrifice or, or repentance, the color blue gives us a picture of hope. Having, having hope in something. And, and when we celebrate Advent, we are basically celebrating that we have hope. Now, it's, it's not a hope about, you know, whether your football team is going to win on Saturday or Sunday, or, you know, I hope that I get a certain thing for Christmas this year, or, you know, I hope that my car doesn't run out of gas before I get to the gas station. You know, that's not what that kind of hope is, but, but the type of hope is a very deep seated hope, realizing that there is absolutely nothing that, that we can do ourselves to, to earn our salvation or, or, or to make things right by ourselves, but we're saying that we are placing all of our hope in Jesus and what he has done and what he continues to do and what Jesus will do in the future. Remember last week we, we shared that Advent really isn't just about getting ready for the birth of the Christ child. You know, it's not about getting your Advent wreaths out or, you know, that, that have those box of candies that you can take out, you know, a piece of candy for each day until Advent. I think I saw somebody say that we're like three days away from, from Christmas because they're at candy number 27 or, or something like that or whatever. You know, it's not about counting down to Christmas, although that's an important part of it, and, and we'll be doing more of a counting down to Christmas starting next week, but it's really about counting down to the second coming, to, to, to Christ returning in glory, to, to make all things right. So, so that's what I want us to be thinking about and, and viewing whenever we think about Advent. It, it's not about the sacrifice. It's not about repentance. It's all about hope. Where we place our hope in 
placing our hope in who Jesus is. You know, speaking of end times, there's a funny thing that happens whenever somebody mentions the end times. It, sometimes people get really overly fixated on it and, and really have everything that they do and say and, and act on revolves around the end times. Or you just kind of just ignore it. You just kind of, kind of put off, well, that, that's not really going to have to really do with me because I'm not planning around being around when the end times happens. But, you know, honestly, do we really know? We, we really, really don't know. And I think the reason why that we either overemphasize the end times and we pull back so much on the end times is because it's a way for us to control it. It's a way for us to say that, that we fully understand everything that's going to happen or, or not happen. So if I really emphasize it and, and echo it and, and, and live in it, then I will know and have every step down that's necessary to make it through these end times. Trace and I, we have a YouTube guy that we like to kind of check in on every once in a while who calls himself the third eagle of the apocalypse. And, and he has had a long series about the end times. Actually, I think recently he's just changed it to these end times because he fully is living and believing that the end times are right here and right now. And, and they are, and in a sense they are. We are living in the end times, but you know, I think there's a lot more that, that God calls us to live into when we think about the end times. Our, our scripture for this Sunday helps give us a picture and, and helps us to take a look at what exactly that means when we talk about living in the end times and living in the hope that we have this season of Advent. Our scripture comes from Isaiah chapter 60, verses 18 through 22, and I invite you to follow along in your Bibles, or we'll have the words printed on the screen for you to follow. Hear the word of the Lord from the book of Isaiah. No longer will violence be heard in your land, nor ruin or destruction within your borders, but you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. The sun will no more be your light and day, nor will the brightness of the moon shine on you. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun will never set again, and your moon will wane no more. The Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of sorrow will end. Then, all your people will be righteous, and they will possess the land forever. They are the shoot I have planted, the work of my hands for the display of my splendor. The least of you will become a thousand, the smallest a mighty nation. I am the Lord. In its time, I will do this swiftly. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, a little bit of background, backstory to this passage. I, Isaiah is writing this to the Israelites who, who have just dealt, been dealt a, a massive blow. And if we go back even a little bit further to verse, to chapter 58, we can see that there is just a lot of destruction, a lot of, of bloodshed, a lot of just unsettling things that the Israelites have had to live through. But even though they had to live through all of these things, Isaiah wanted to give them a promise. And that promise that Isaiah is giving them is like, look, that won't be a part of who you are anymore. That, that, that won't be a part of your story. That there won't be any violence. That there won't be any ruin or, or destruction you will be safe. You will be secure. You will have everything that you need. And the reason why you have everything that you need is because Christ 
will be with you. Now we know Isaiah didn't talk about Christ being with you, but, but this is who he is pointing to. He is pointing to the coming of the Christ to bring light to the entire world. So let's fast forward from this passage to about 400, 500 years to a man named Jesus. A man named Jesus who was born in Bethlehem and who grew up and then uh, was baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist. And as soon as he was baptized, he was then sent off to the wilderness where he was tempted, if you remember, by, by Satan for 40 days. And, and the temptation that he had to deal with, those temptations that, honestly, we deal with, 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 with food, with security, with, with power. Though those three things he tempted Jesus with, and Jesus withstood them all because he knew he didn't need that. He, he didn't need those things from Satan. And after his temptation, Jesus started his earthly ministry. And what did he do? He started his earthly ministry by doing the thing that was probably easiest and most convenient for him. He decided to go back to where he came from, to Galilee. And, and he started going around and he, he started to teach around the Sea of Galilee. And, and, and his fame started to, to perk up. People really enjoyed hearing his messages and, and understanding what he's talking about us. He, he's, he's taking these stories from the Old Testament or from the, the, the Bible that we know and that we live in, and he's telling us that, that it is about to happen right here and right now, and everybody was getting excited. And then Jesus made a mistake. He decided to go back to his hometown. And we know how that always goes, that ha happens, don't we? You know, usually when you get back to your hometown, that's sometimes you get the most negativity. And, and that's what happened to Jesus. Jesus goes and he speaks his first sermon there in Nazareth. And we're going to pick up at verse 16, Luke chapter 4, verse 16, where Jesus goes to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoner and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll. He gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And then he began by saying to them, Today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, those last words that Jesus said in this passage, Today, in this, this scripture has been filled in your hearing brought joy to the Israelites. It brought joy to the Nazarenes because they realized this is the guy that's going to take care of everything. He has promised us and he has shown us how he has come to set things right. Because even though they were back in Nazareth, things were not all right. You know, they, they had the temple down in Jerusalem that was rebuilt. And, and they had their ways, their synagogues to, to learn and, and to hear but they still were under control by the Romans. And they felt Jesus was saying today, all of you poor people, you are going to be set free because that is what I am here to do. So they loved it. They, they ate this up. They said, this is, this is amazing. But then Jesus kept talking. And Jesus shared two particular stories that made the crowd turn against him, but really it shouldn't have. It should have given them even more hope of the promise that he came to give them. The first story he told them was about Elijah. And Elijah was uh, walking around and he uh, ran into a widow from, uh, from Sidon, which is in Lebanon. 
And, and this widow lost her son, and, and he brought the son back to life, but also uh, was, had, didn't have enough food. And, and, and Elijah helped provide food for them, food that wouldn't run out. And Jesus is looking at them saying, you know what, there were a lot of widows in Israel. How come Elijah didn't help them out? Why did he have to help out a foreigner? And then he said, well, you know, the guy after him, Elisha, he ran into a guy by the name of Naaman who was not only a foreigner, but he was a military man. So he had control over you, but he had leprosy. And Elijah helped get him healed from his leprosy. So with all the other people in leprosy in Israel, how come Elisha didn't help them out? This infuriated the people in Nazareth so much that we hear that they, they grabbed Jesus and they tried to shove him off of the side of a hill, but then Jesus was able to escape and leave. And then we have this pattern. When Jesus is trying to give a picture of hope, to those that he is talking to, and he continues to be rejected. Now, you may be wondering, okay, Pastor Chris, you talked about this passage in Isaiah chapter 60, and then you're sharing with what Jesus preached about, but if you look in the book of Isaiah, they are side by side with each other. Our, our, our scripture for the day was in Isaiah chapter 60, and, and the words that Jesus preached on that morning were from Isaiah chapter 60. 61. And, and there's one thing that, that ties those two passages together and helps us to see what this season of Advent is all about. It is all about restoration. It is all about making things right. Things that were once broken and, and, and putting them back together. Instead of having a picture of destruction and bloodshed that we heard about in Isaiah chapter 58, we see a promise. We see a promise that there will no longer be any more violence, but everything will be restored by light, the light of Jesus Christ, the light that will, will never grow dark a light that won't, won't fade, a, a light that won't disappear, but a light that will always be present in each and every one of our lives because Christ has come. And we now are called to live into his light. You may have heard a phrase that is batted around during this Advent season that's called already but not yet. We're, we're, we're already seeing glimpses of the kingdom breaking through, but we're not fully all the way there yet. See, that is what we need to remember when we come to the season of Advent, when we, when we come into the season of celebration, is that we hold on to this hope that, that, we, have been, that we have received from Jesus Christ to know that not everything has been totally fixed, but it will. Not everything will be full in fruition, but it will come to pass because of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. You know, we see that when we just take a look at the news, don't we? We see this fully playing out. We, we see cancer invading people that we love. We see mental illness, we see school shootings, we see dictators, we see political uprisings. But Advent gives us the opportunity to hope. Advent gives us the opportunity to hope knowing that, that we, all of us, are invited to be a part of that restoration. That, that we have a role to play in God's kingdom it's what we pray when we pray the Lord's Prayer, to make it on earth as it is in heaven. 
but we have to remember that restoration isn't powered by us. It's powered by Christ. It's empowered by His love and by His grace. And when that becomes a part of who we are, then we can share that hope with the world around us. You know, when we come to this table, we, we come to celebrate communion for restoration, to make things right with us, within us. When we eat the bread and when we drink from the cup, we are reminded of what our scripture says today that Christ came to restore our relationship between God. Now, not, not, to, not to pay a, a penalty or anything, but it, he came to be victorious over sin and the power of evil in the world. And when we partake of communion, we then are invited to participate in that work with him. It's a blessing. It's a blessing to be able to come and receive the gift of bread and cup. It's a blessing because we come ready to receive. We come with our hands open wide saying, God, give to me your grace. Give to me the forgiveness of my sins so that I can then reflect you to the world around us. Would you please pray with me? Oh God, as we come to this table, we know that this world is not right yet. We can see glimpses of your kingdom breaking through through the ministries that we have here in our church, through the way that we are in relationship with our sisters and brothers around us. So God, as we continue to move through this season of Advent, this season of hope, help us to hold on to that promise that there will be no more wars, there will be no more famine, there will be no more desolation, but through the light of Jesus Christ, the promise that we hear in Revelation that you will make all things new. And the power and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that lives within us and then be shared with the world around us. So Lord, bless this holy meal. Bless this time together and allow us to fully live into the redemption that you have graciously given us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.